I was once told the story of a fisherman's wife who, in order to help guide her husband home when he was out late on dark nights, would set a lantern in her window. Pretty soon, other fishermen and sailors took notice and said, Henrietta, if you're putting the light out for him, could you put it out for us too? And so she did. Every night, diligently lit her lantern in that second story window. No matter who was out there, whether or not anyone was out there, Her name was Henrietta Berg. She lived on a small island east of the Keweenaw in Lake Superior, one of Michigan's first unofficial keepers of the light. They would later build a lighthouse in that exact spot. I was five or six when I visited my first lighthouse. I don't remember too many details. We didn't go inside just squinted up at the massive white tower as the wind whipped through us and around us and the sound of waves crashed rhythmically until <sighs> I fell asleep. When my parents discovered that a trip to the lighthouse could put their energetic five-year-old to sleep, they couldn't stay away. Luckily for them, Michigan has more lighthouses than any other state. 129. I like to imagine all of those little dots of light peppering our 3,200, 3,200 3, miles of shoreline. My mom became positively enamored with lighthouses during all of those visits. And pretty soon she wanted to see them all. And so she kept dragging me and my sisters despite my naps getting much, much shorter. The sand dunes were radiating heat. My cheese and cracker lunch was not holding me over. And I wanted to be anywhere but here. I had one person to blame for all of it. Mom, haven't we seen enough lighthouses? They all look the same to me. Despite dragging my feet, I was still somehow many paces in front of my mother. I looked back, hoping the annoyance on my face would make her feet move faster. She was beaming, brighter than the white lighthouse itself. It was impossible to ignore how much she loved these places. I'm hungry, my feet hurt, hurry up, let's go. Once inside, my shoulder slid between sweaty tourists looking at postcards and keychains. I took a deep breath that I instantly regretted. Oh, mildew. I'm going up. I wasn't that tall at 11 years old, but still felt the need to duck my head as I crossed the threshold to the spiral staircase. Fear suddenly washed over me. They're just steps. You walk up steps all the time. There's nothing to be afraid of. Yet somehow the spiral was making my head spin and my stomach turn. Whew. One foot, another foot. One foot, another foot. One foot, another foot. The railing was ice cold. Another foot. One foot, another foot. Is anyone behind me? Maybe I should go faster. One foot, another foot. 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 This is a lot of steps. How am I this out of shape as a fifth grader? One foot, another foot. One foot, another foot. One foot, another foot. One foot, another foot. Oh no, people were coming down. Try not to show them your fear. Try not to breathe too heavy as they pass. Smile at them but don't look them in the eye or you might lose your footing and fall to your death. That would totally ruin lighthouses for your mom. Hi. One foot, another foot, one foot, another foot, one foot, another foot, one foot, another foot, one foot, another foot. Oh. <sighs> 
Can't you just see the job description now? Seeking immediately, lighthouse keeper. Work from home position with remote options and very remote options. Steady salary, private lakefront property included. A modern day dream job, if only we hadn't invented electricity. I wasn't thinking about any of that in that moment though. All I was thinking about as I gripped the railing was, stay down, cheese and crackers. I didn't end up throwing up at the top of the lighthouse. I waited until I got to the bottom, like a lady. And I had to admit, much to my mother's satisfaction, that lighthouses were intriguing, peaceful enough to put you to sleep, and terrifying enough to make you hurl. They were full of juxtapositions, assertive, yet elusive, strong and steadfast amidst storms and chaos. Lighthouses were a lot like women. Five years later, different lighthouse, different trip. This one on South Manitou Island. I thought I heard a cricket, but then I spotted my mom in the distance with her disposable camera. Rit, 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 rit. I meandered inside the base of the lighthouse, quickly locking my eyes on anything there was to read. It was very important that nobody asked me if I want to go to the top. That's when I saw the list. Keepers of the light. Every name of every person who'd ever held the keeper or assistant keeper post here at South Manitou Island Lighthouse. I scanned the list of names up and down. James, James, John, James, Thomas, Benjamin, Thomas, John, William, Philip, John, James, James, John, Julia. Julia? Mrs. Julia Sheridan, first assistant keeper, served 1872 to 1878. The only woman on this list of probably 60 names. Now I want to know about her. What is it you want to know? Holy Julia? Are, are you a ghost? What is it you want to know? Well, I, I, I want to know if you're a ghost, but <laughs> yeah, you're probably not going to tell me that. Um, hi. <laughs> what was it like being a first assistant keeper? It was much the same as being a keeper's wife. You see, my husband shattered his arm in the Civil War. And so I had been assisting him for several years. We helped each other carry the oil up the steps. I held the matchbox and he struck the match. In 1872, I was finally paid to do the job I had been doing for six years. How did you die? Sorry, I, I probably shouldn't ask that. It's all right. It was the beginning of April, one of the first really, really lovely days of that year. Our friend asked my husband Aaron and I if we wanted to take our baby boy out on his new boat. A sudden squall ripped through and swung the sailboat's boom around, striking Aaron on the head and throwing him off the boat. As the boat capsized, I was plunged into the water. Oh, it was ice cold. I managed to grab onto the side of the boat with my free arm and clutched my sweet baby Robert as tightly as I could with the other. Oh, 
Aaron wasn't resurfacing. I shouted for him. I shouted for help. I tried to hold on, but the waves were pulling me and my fingers were slipping. I looked to the lighthouse, our home. I gasped, and before the waves pulled me under, I saw the faces of two of my other sons in the lighthouse window, watching all of it in horror. Oh my God, that's awful. I'm so sorry. It was a terrible day. No, it was actually a really lovely day with a really terrible moment. Are there a lot of you? Dead people? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, women of the watch, keepers of the light. More than you would guess, and less than there should have been. Oh no, my, my family's leaving without me. Again, I gotta go. <laughs> Thank you for telling me your story, ghost lighthouse keeper lady. But she and her baby were already fading away. Julia Sheridan. Julia Sheridan, Julia Sheridan, Julia Sheridan. And as I raced out of the lighthouse, I couldn't stop thinking about her story. I could see her husband in the water, reaching with his good arm, unable to get to the top. I could see her fingers slipping off the side of the boat and the image of her two sons in the lighthouse window watching all of it. And then it hit me. Julia's story was just one woman's story at one lighthouse on one small island in Lake Michigan. <laughs> How many more stories were out there? <laughs> I spent my young life coming to these lighthouses puking on these grounds. Why hadn't I heard any of these women's stories until now? I was bound and determined to find out. Little did I know what I was getting myself into. Unsolved mysteries, cover-ups, weird cult island takeovers. That ghost encounter on South Manitou Island Lighthouse was just the tip of the iceberg. It was time to finally shed some light on the women of the watch. is Mary Thurston Terry. I have been serving as the head keeper here at the Sandpoint Lighthouse in Escanaba, Michigan since 1868. 18 years. 6,175 nights of walking up these steps with my lanterns to start the light. Well, my husband was the original appointee. When they asked John to be the new keeper at the lighthouse they were building, we were overjoyed. I never doubted our suitedness for a moment. John, are you sure we'll be able to manage it all? Other people have children to help. Some even have assistance. I mean, it's just you and me. I mean, did you look at this book of instructions? Oil the clockwork, keep a daily log book, record weather daily, care for station boats, Make necessary repairs. Scrub all windows daily. Scrub all lenses daily. Scrub all lanterns daily. So much scrubbing. 
Oh, and this one. <laughs> Scrub all washes daily. Oh, they hardly even mention keeping the light lit all night long. That does seem to be the whole point, doesn't it? Gosh, will we ever sleep? I told my friend Lydia about your post. She thinks you're going to be a hero. I should have told her about all the scrubbing. Oh, no sick leave shall be granted by any superintendent unless they are satisfied that the keeper is actually too sick to appear for duty. Are you listening, John? John? Had we known John had tuberculosis, we never would have accepted that post. Or rather, they never would have granted it. A childless woman, a widow, a lighthouse keeper, impossible. When I put in my application for the post after John's death, the government officials told me that my husband's corpse would be better suited to carrying out the keeper's responsibilities than a lady would. Yet, somehow, the community in Escanaba wanted me to do it. I think they knew I needed something to help me grieve John's death. And they trusted me. I had so many endorsements, the superintendent had to give me the job. And in May of 1868, I lit the first ever light here at Sand Point. From 48 feet high, a fourth order Fresnel lens with one lantern and one reflector, a fixed red light possessing a radiating power of 11 and one half miles. Since that first night, the light has never failed to cast its friendly rays across the water. Oh, the local newspaper even wrote about me, calling me methodical, careful, and very particular in her care of the charge. In March of 1886, local firefighters were alerted that the Sandpoint Lighthouse was on fire with Mary trapped inside. Despite being down the road, the snow was too deep, and by the time they got there, most of the lighthouse had been badly burned. And all that remained of Mary was her skeleton. A terrible accident. An unfortunate tragedy. But Mary had been light keeping for 18 years. She seemed far too adept at her duties to die in an accidental fire. They found that the south door of the lighthouse was locked, but open, with the bolt jammed forward, as if someone had thrust it in. Mary was a very frugal woman, and she saved every penny she ever earned. Over the years, she amassed $4,000 in gold coins, the equivalent of over $100,000 today. She was a woman of means, living alone in her late 60s, working a job that many men would have killed to have. No one knows what truly happened that night. The coroner's jury ruled that Mary Terry came to her death from causes and by means unknown. And to her, to this day, her death is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in Escanaba. It's no mystery. Anne is my companion. She always has been and always will be, and I expect to die here with Anne and with the place just as they have been for so long. Miss Harriet Colfax, the oldest, staunchest, and most reliable keeper in the United States, served at the Michigan City Lighthouse for 43 years. From her appointment in 1861, 
until her retirement in 1904 at aged 80. She broke records for her long tenure and her age, but was remembered for her petite stature, her near misses with death, and her commitment to the light above all else. No one would have ever guessed that she entered the light-keeping business cold. A, a beaconer? It might suit you well, Harriet. Plenty of time outside, self-sufficiency, peace and solitude. My cousin, Skylar Colfax, knew I had no intention of marrying a man. But I'm a woman, I reminded him. There are women keepers? Yes, wives and daughters of keepers, not spinsters who know nothing of the trade. Schuyler knew I was right, but he was serving as Speaker of the House at the time, and he told me he'd put in a good word with President Lincoln. Don't tell him how small I am. People in town knew it was just my political connection that got me the job. But when they saw me work, they quickly learned what a good choice I was. Keeping the light suited me like a hand in a glove. I picked up everything quickly, and I adored the waves, the light, the cycle of the moon. I even adored all of the weather. But the better I got, the harder it became. They were hoping I would crumble from the pressure. So they added a beacon at the end of a 1,500 foot long elevated walkway on the east end of the pier. When I proved I wasn't going to leave the job so easily, they added another beacon on the west end of the pier, accessible by a rowboat, followed by a hike along the shore and another longer, elevated walkway. I carried my pails of heated lard oil to all of the beacons and just prayed that it would not congeal before I got there. If it did, I would have to retrace my steps, lug the oil back into the boat, row back to the house, heat it, and repeat the entire process. During storms, there were several nights that I barely made it out with my life. One particular night toward the end of 1886, with my pail of heated lard oil in one hand and my lantern in the other, I sallied forth into one of the most tumultuous storms that ever raged on the coast of Lake Michigan. The sleet stung my face. The furious wind drove the sand of the dunes and the spray of the seas pelting against me. Oh, and the darkness of the tempest fell so suddenly I could scarcely find the wave-washed end of the pier. But I gained it, grasped the handrail, and with head bent, struggled forward to the beacon tower. I struggled along gained the stairway, and in the shelter of the beacon, filled the great lamp and lighted it. Then I came down, drenched to the skin, chilled to the bone, and for the first time scared almost to fainting. The tornado had increased in fury. The slender stairs quaked beneath me, and the tower wavered. Oh, and the noise was like the rending of a thousand sails. I had barely gained my way back to the mainland when I heard a grinding crash. I looked back to see the beacon like some great big meteor whirl through an arc in the livid night and fall hissing into the lake. All night, I watched from the beacon above my own house and just prayed that no ships would venture in. 
or that the main light, which I kept burning more brightly than ever, might guide them past the wreck of the beacon pier. Boy, sailor boy, sailor boy, true. The lamps in our towers are lighted for you. The seas may rage, your hearts will not fail. Ride through the foam, never fearing of the gale. God in his mercy will lead you aright As you watch the lighthouse lamps burn bright The wind is your lullaby when raging seas foam Sailor boy, sailor boy, we welcome you back home Sailor boy, sailor boy, sailor boy, true The lamps in our towers are lighted for you The seas may rage, your hearts will not fail Ride through the foam, never fearing of the gale Sailor boy, sailor boy, sailor boy, true. Your dear darling mother is praying for you. Your sweet bride is weeping as vigils she keeps, not knowing that your ship drowned in the deep. As she walks on the shore, her eyes out to sea. Oh, husband, my sailor boy, come back to me. The waves dash up at her feet in a foam. Your sailor boy will never more come home. And in the morning, when the daylight came and I had snuffed the harbor light, I went down to the pier to see the ruin which the storm had wrought. The beacon tower was gone. Half of the pier had been dismantled and the shore was strewn with the wreckage of a structure that had withstood the storms of 15 years. I have seen many storms, but never one like that. On Sunday evening, April 17th, 1905, Harriet's spirit peacefully passed over. She was 80 years young. For 43 years, she was Michigan City's faithful keeper and captains of passing ships referred to the port as Miss Harriet's Light. Just a few weeks earlier, her lifetime companion, Miss Anne C. Hartwell passed over too. She was also a beloved and well-known character in Michigan City, known for teaching everyone in town their ABCs. The two women who were said to have had such a strong mutual affection for one another, with never an ill word between them, are buried side by side in Greenwood Cemetery. You know, I'm glad they had each other I can't imagine working a lighthouse by myself. <sighs> I think I'd lose my mind. I mean, have you ever been isolated inside your house for long stretches of time with no one to talk to and nothing to do but mundane, repetitive household tasks? 
Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Many nights, I imagine my husband showing up shivering and drenched at the door with a silly little grin. But I knew it was all in my head. I told myself, Elizabeth Van Riper, your husband has been at the bottom of Lake Michigan for three years now. Two of my brothers and my three nephews also found graves beneath the water. It is a sorrow that never ends through life. Still, our lamps must brightly burn. I think all of the loss gave me a deeper interest in our sailors' lives than ever before. I longed to do something for humanity's sake. And keeping this little light lit was something. I was eventually given many honors for my fastidiousness. Best kept light on Lake Michigan. And I was so sick of women being told they couldn't work, they couldn't succeed on their own. I knew women were strong and clever and creative and ambitious and were so much more than a pretty face for a man to love. My work was proof of that. And yet, I was so lonely in that big lighthouse all by myself. Was it greedy to want love again, too? <laughs> Elizabeth married Daniel Williams in 1875. The two seemed perfectly compatible. Daniel never interfered with Elizabeth's light keeping, and Elizabeth never deferred it to him. <laughs> they were together for 63 years. When Elizabeth was transferred to the Harbor Springs light, the little Traverse light, from the Beaver Island Harbor light, Daniel and Elizabeth would often invite their friends and neighbors over to the lighthouse to entertain them with live music. There is a young maiden who lives on the shore. She lives on the shore all alone. No, oh, there's nothing she can find to comfort her mind. But to walk all alone on the shore, shore, shore. But to walk all alone on the shore. There is a young captain who sailed the salt sea. Let the wind blow high, blow low. I will die, I will die, the young captain did cry. If I can't have that maid on the shore, shore, shore. If I can't have that maid on the shore. Well, I have lots of silver, I have lots of gold. I have lots of costly wear, oh, I'll divide, I'll divide with my lowly ship's crew. If they'll row me that mate on the shore, 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 if they'll row me that mate on the shore. After much persuasion, they got her on board. Let the wind blow high, blow low. They replaced her away in his cabin below. There's an end to all sorrow and care, care, care. There's an end to all sorrow and care. They replaced her away in his cabin below. Let the wind blow high, blow low. She's so pretty and sweet. She's so neat and complete. She sang captain and sailors to sleep, sleep, sleep. She sang captain and sailors to sleep. Then she robbed them of silver, she robbed them of gold. 
She robbed them of costly wear, oh. She took his broadsword instead of an oar. And she paddled her way back to shore, shore, shore. And she paddled her way back to shore. Well, me men must be crazy, me men must be mad. Me men must be in deep despair, oh, to take her away from my cabin so gay. And to paddle her back to the shore, shore, shore. And to paddle her back to the shore. Well, your men are not crazy, your men are not mad. Your men are not in deep despair, oh. I deceived all your sailors as well as yourself. And I'm still the maid on the shore, shore, shore. Yes, I'm still the maid on the shore. Elizabeth was also an accomplished writer. She wrote several poems, and in 1905, she published her best-selling memoir, A Child of the Sea and Life Among the Mormons. In it, she recounts her action-packed childhood around the time that James Strang, Mormon leader and self-proclaimed king, arrived with his followers to the island. I'll do my own introductions. James Strang, born in Scipio, New York. You can call me King. That's enough. Elizabeth's family formed a unique acquaintanceship with Strang, and there were several years of friendliness between the two, until Strang began instructing his followers to rob and kill anyone on the island that refused to convert to Mormonism. So Elizabeth's family escaped to Charlevoix and wouldn't return to Beaver Island until several years later, after James Strang's death. Henrietta, if you're putting the light out for him, could you put it out for us too? I like to imagine all of those little dots of light peppering our 3,200 3,200 32, miles of shoreline. One foot, another foot, one foot, another foot, one foot, another foot. Stay down, cheese and crackers. Rit, 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 rit. Rit, 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 rit. James, James, John, James, Thomas, Benjamin, Thomas, John, Philip, William, John, James, James, John, Julia more than you would guess, and less than there should have been. The coroner's jury ruled that Mary Terry came to her death from causes and by means unknown. The government officials told me that my husband's corpse would be better suited to carrying out the keeper's responsibilities than a lady would. Miss Harriet Colfax, the oldest, staunchest, and most reliable keeper in the United States. I have seen many storms, but never one like that. Elizabeth was also an accomplished writer. I was so lonely in that big lighthouse all by myself. Was it greedy to want love again too? A couple of months ago, my parents, my sister and I were in Grand Rapids. There was a terrible snowstorm, but we were only a half hour away from the lighthouse in Grand Haven. And this time I was the one dragging them. Come on, it'll be cool to see the lake like this. And here was my chance to experience the winter shore the way that Harriet, Mary, and Elizabeth did. I somehow convinced them and we were in the car. <laughs> Every five minutes, my mom said, this doesn't seem safe, we should turn around. And I was beginning to question the risk versus the reward with each white knuckle moment. As we got closer, 
The roads narrowed and the snow rose. Pretty soon, the lake was beside us. Big, huge chunks of ice bobbed and swayed gently. You had to stare to catch the movement. Siri told us to turn, but there was a big chain blocking the, the road leading to the lighthouse. Road closed for season. What? No. We, we drove all this way. We, we came through the storm. My dad sighed. Well, I guess we turn around and go back. No, I, I psyched myself up to be cold but brave. I wanted to carry my oil up the steps and feel the sleet stinging my face like Harriet. There was a little parking lot up the road. It was totally unplowed, but we managed to follow some tracks. We parked and looked out at the water and the way that the storm moved it. Peaceful enough to put you to sleep. Terrifying enough to make you hurl. Well, I'm going out. Who's going with me? It was my mom that led the charge. I was thrilled wrapped my scarf around my face, and pressed the car door against the screaming wind. <sighs> Even behind sunglasses, I had to squint against the brightness of the snow. My mom and I chugged along arm in arm. Every so often, we looked back and realized we'd only moved an inch. The car was still right there. But just being out in the elements made the whole experience infinitely more invigorating. Let's walk to there, I said, pointing to a fence marking the start of the beach. One foot, another foot, one foot, another foot. We stood and soaked it in. You could see the dull gray outline of the lighthouse in the distance. Then the wind turned vicious. Time to get back in the car. I sent a quiet thank you with amazement and gratitude to all of the lighthouse keepers of the past. <sighs> Back in the car, I thought about my own personal beacon. How many miles did that travel? How many people were grateful for it? How many beacons had I been grateful for? even if I never got the chance to say so. Then all at once, I heard women's voices. Voices that were simultaneously lugging oil up steps, trimming wicks, <laughs> scrubbing windows. They said, you don't have to count the ships. You just have to tend the light. <laughs> 